Hi, everybody. This is Mark Siegel from First Second Books, and I am very excited to be in the company of Kate Reed Petty and Faith Hicks and Nidhi Chandani today. And their books currently are Jukebox is Nidhi's newest work. The Leak is Kate Reed Petty's. And Nothing Can Possibly Go Wrong uh, is a reissue in a, a whole new revamped edition of a favorite of Faith's. And uh, so here we are, and thank you to ALA Midwinter for hosting us, and thank you for all of you joining and listening in. So we have um, three very, very special creators, and each one uh, with a very different voice, you could say, and but at the same time, some commonalities. And it's kind of interesting to me that Kate, uh, the leak is is your first solo outing uh, as a you know graphic novel writer. Uh, you you did write uh, on Casma Nights was our first first second project together. Uh, this one, the leak follows a, a, a young journalist. Uh, a, a beginning journalist, essentially. Uh, what, and then Nidhi has, Nidhi's first book with us, Pashmina, was a very beloved and acclaimed uh, debut. And Jukebox is your next work. And Faith has, I mean, Faith, I, I don't know if you like the word veteran, but I mean, you're, you have, several thousand pages of comics under your belt at this point. So many. <laughs> yeah. I've seven. seen Instagram, some piles and piles of pages. Say again. Seven graphic novels with first second and 15 total. So that I've drawn. Yeah, I've drawn. You've drawn. <laughs> so yeah. So it's, it's fascinating because you're, you know, the three of you have your own paths. Um, but, but I feel like, you know, here we are, first of all, not, not just as professionals, but as people, and in your cases, very creative, inspired people, uh, driven into a creative field. Uh, and then we're here in, in 2020, and, uh, as we record this today. <laughs> um, and, you know, I guess before we dive into the projects and the work and all this is like, What's it like? You know, how are you faring? How's how's your creative life uh, in this changed world of ours? You know, I, I wonder. Um, it's completely the same and completely different. I mean, I feel like cartoonists were uniquely, I guess, suitable to deal with drawing and continuing to work in a pandemic. Like I work from home. Um, the big difference in my life is I, you know, I can't go out and see my friends. Uh, I'm based in Vancouver. We're in lockdown right now, unfortunately. Um, and my husband is working from home as well. He's an, an animator at an animation studio here in Vancouver. But I just finished drawing a graphic novel that I had written and started drawing before the pandemic started. And now it's done. And I somehow managed to do it all throughout all of this. So I don't know. I mean, it both affected me and then didn't affect me. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what Faith said is so accurate. It's it's the same and then it's totally not the same. I definitely feel the lack of going out and traveling and seeing people and kind of getting like almost juiced up by everybody's um, positive energy and the interactions and the love of books. Um, so I miss that a lot. Initially, it was just kind of very familiar to be working at home, even with my child running around um, and my husband here all the time. Um, that was a big adjustment. But at the same time, we all have luckily our own space. But I think it's really that um, the, the kind of the dips are heavier because I don't have that you know you don't have that burst of interacting with people and going out and seeing new things and being inspired um it's very limited so within that I'm still able to work um because I'm really used to it but it's also you know 
it's it's not easy yeah, yeah. I, I agree with both of you and feel like um i am really grateful though the thing i've been focusing on a lot has been my because i am sort of trapped in my home thinking about finding new kinds of inspiration around my home. And so um, I, I got like a pet fish a little bit before the pandemic. He's one of those beta fish that, you know, have to live alone and, and solitary. So um, he's been a good friend during this time. And I feel like kind of a metaphor for, for finding beauty and within like a tiny glass tank that we're all in. Um, but it's such a treat to see, I do actually really love getting to see other people's homes and like getting to see people on Zoom and like conversations like this are such, um, such a unique delight. Like we, we would never get to do this in any other world very frequently. So um, I am happy for that. Although I, I definitely agree both with with you, Faith and Nidhi, about the debt. The lows are low for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. It's I mean, it, yeah, seeing other people's home. It's weird, you know, because we. It's like in in publishing, especially there's there's the milestones of you know there's ALA, there's Book Expo, there's there's the Comic Cons. There's TCAF, you know, there's some of these shows that for me, 14, 15 years running, you know, where every single year never missed one, you know, and then for many of us, it's like that. It's like, oh, instead of us all leaving our homes and going someplace, you know, where there's a kind of a, a hub, it's become this decentralized thing and we get to peek into each other's homes, you know, it's very strange. <laughs> very strange. And, I, and I've noticed also, I think another feature that that I'm seeing in speaking with people and friends and especially other and for second creators is I think in the, there's an ambient stress level this year that's just a background that's a given so it feels like every stress that comes along you know small or big stressors hit a little harder um, so, and people are a little you know it's like our tolerances have been pushed uh, which I, you know, I wonder what that does for the creative life and for, you know, all, all kinds of our many, the many, our many lives, you know? Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but um, I've been struggling with some guilt lately. <laughs> like, Because um, you're having too much fun. No, no, <laughs> so burned out. Like the, the process of drawing a graphic novel is, um, it's like running a marathon and I burn out every single time I do it. Um, the reality is you reach page 200 and you have 18 more pages to draw and I, I just want to die, you know, and I never want to draw ever again. Um, but I don't feel guilty about burnout for the most part. It's just the reality of this very difficult art form that we work in. But this year, man, I felt really guilty about it because it was like, you know, I was surrounded by so many examples of like people losing their jobs, struggling financially. And my overwhelming feeling was, oh, I need to be grateful. You know, I need to be grateful for this job that I have and I shouldn't feel burned out. So yeah, that was, uh, that was not fun dealing with that particular layer of stress. I don't know if you guys have dealt with that. It's like kind of toxic, right? That feeling that if you don't have as many extenuating circumstances that therefore you don't have stress or you don't have, you know, that burnout that you need to recover from and all those things. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels, um, but you can't necessarily have, you don't have the same outlet, right? Faith, you like, you don't get to see your friends and actually like unburden yourself in that situation. So yeah, that is, that's a challenge. It is. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's, there's some interesting comfort to be taken in the fact that, you know, at the, at the start of the, the lockdown and in, in like May and June, you know, there, we, you know, big question marks were in the air about, okay, what is going to happen? I mean, we're in this lucky category, you know, in, in publishing, like able to continue. I mean, for a second, basically, and most of Macmillan it flipped a switch and like in three days we were pretty much operational, you know, and, and we had to figure out some of the production stuff and some of like the physical copies of things getting places took a little longer, but we were able to work. And then by June, it was clear that people really want what we do. And we, I include you, you know, especially like we're, we're a service industry to creators like you. And, 
um, and it's not obsolete. On the contrary, you know what you're doing is more treasured, it's more welcome, it's more needed out there. You know that's pretty huge, right? And I think that can that can help shore up, you know, and and give you fuel to to go. And we were it was kind of an amazing moment, you know, where like at Macmillan, there was a, a decision to to cut a lot of salaries by like thirty percent above a certain rate. You know, the junior salaries were left untouched and protected. And then come June, uh, the head of, of Macmillan at the time, John Sargent, saw like we're selling, we're, the books are the books are are going out in such numbers that he reinstated people's salaries and nobody was expecting that. You know, like the back pay and everything. So it was kind of a, a strange moment. And I mean, these days everything is is so tenuous, you know, you don't want to jinx it, but but at the same time, even in bad times, even in rough times, people need good stories. You know, people need art and people need, you know, characters that resonate. And you know, and this is this is what you do, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and it's so it's great. I mean, for it's you know, on a practical level, it's a it's a bit of a relief to have that. There's a there's some security to that, but but also on the on the deeper level, you know, that you're you've chosen this path, you know, <laughs> of of pulling things out of nowhere and out of yourselves and 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 putting them out into the world. And it's great. They're loved, you know, they're they're being received and welcomed and that's so that's so wonderful to hear, Mark. It feels really I and I agree. I feel like I feel that, but it, it's just wonderful to hear it again. Um, just because it is, this is a time when the problems are so dire. And, and as, as Faith, you say, it's like, I feel very lucky to have this as my vocation. Um, but it's nice to remember that like, as dire as the problems are, and as important as the work that like first responders and healthcare workers and so many people are doing really important work, there is still there is still value in the arts and in human human stories and connections and storytelling. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's easy to sort of like focus on the, 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 the most dire kind of situations, but I think you're right that it is, this has definitely been a time to practice um, valuing all of the different pieces of society that, that we miss or that we need or that keep us going in this time. So thanks for saying that. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, let's dive in a little into into your projects because they're, I mean, they are projects for our time, and I and I feel like it's um, in that context, you know, of, of like it is relevant. It's like I I feel really strengthened in the relevance of of your work, you know, and and uh, and that's that's not a small thing, you know. So, I, Kate, let's let's start with you. Let's so so there's this book called The Leak. Um, which definitely has a special place in my heart, and I, I remember I remember the first conversation about it, um, and so it's packed with things that are going to be very popular, I think, with many young readers and also educators, especially librarians. You know, you're you're into things like the free speech, the importance of free speech, the dangers of corruption. Can you just tell us a little bit about? about Ruth yeah. and about the, the, the inception. Yeah, with pleasure. Um, I, I guess the, especially Ruth is such the perfect introduction to this. She, the main character of the leak, um, I think she really, she sort of came from my love of Harriet the spy from when I was a child. And I think of her in that kind of tradition where she's a precocious, um, you know, speaks her mind, um, is going to go out and grab life and do what she wants to do, even though she's 13 and, and everybody in her life is saying that, um, you know, you need to be in school, you need to do things a certain way. And so she is committed to being a journalist. That's her dream and what she wants to do. And she's already started a newsletter that she sends out every week with stories around her hometown that she shares. Um, and the book is basically about her investigating. She finds something strange in the lake in her neighborhood. And that investigation leads her into a environmental scandal that's much larger than, you know, a 13 year old girl really would be equipped to handle. Um, and through sort of investigating this and learning how to kind of raise awareness of it, she really explores, you know, the ethics of journalism. What does it mean to 
speak for the truth? What does it mean to you know confront corruption and, and powerful voices when you think that they're doing wrong? So it is sort of a, it sort of starts with this fun kind of playful character, but then I think it is, as you say, it's about, you know, truth and civic, civic engagement and, and the power that each of us has in a world that feels like the powerful have, can keep us down. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you managed to pull it off where you, you know, you're, you're, you're exploring all these things, but you're also giving us like a riveting story, you know, and a really resonant character. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think it speaks, you know, it's, it's very much in line in terms of, and, and the artwork, Andrea, you know. Oh, she's so great, yeah. Such a great job on, uh, on this, uh, like a very fresh feeling to it, but it speaks to the same readers as, you know, best friends and real friends and some of the, like stargazing and some of the favorite middle grade, um, relatable life. Yeah. yeah, I love Andrea at one point. I think I think she wrote something about this a little bit, but um, we've had conversations about Ruth as sort of the 13-year-old the girl in both of our hearts, that we really connect with her, and, and her as the character really um, made this book easy to write. Uh, you know, writing is never easy, but but it really felt organic to, to bring Ruth into the world because she is such a, um, a meaningful character to, to me, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Nidhi, let's uh, let's talk about let's <laughs> talk about jukebox a little. you so we we've uh, we've worked together for a while now. We've had so your first book. You actually made history at one level because you you know, it's definitely the the first uh, Indian American graphic novel. And Pashmina, I was I was so proud of that when that came together. I felt like you you know you were jumping from your illustration career, you know, this was your first graphic novel and you basically, you took that, that, that new language, you know, and made it your own. Uh, and so that's, that's been a super exciting journey. And now with Jukebox, like, tell us, tell us a little bit about like, this is a very different project in some ways. It's still, it I recognize your, you know, your, your visual handwriting is, is similar but you've definitely leveled it up in this one and you're also like you're taking us in a very different uh in a very different ride i feel like I, I definitely agree i feel like that's very true i just i just finished proofing it this morning so it's cool. it's cool. uh fresh in my mind yeah um and it's it's that interesting place where now having finished it many months ago and looking at it again for the first time in a while. Um, it's that out of body experience of, you know, who made this? This is good, I like this, you know? Um, and I, I definitely felt that way about Pashmina too, but I, I was finding my footing, you know, with Pashmina and um, I think it's, I, I love it obviously, um, but also because jukebox is very fresh. Um, you know, I think that I was able to level up in story and understanding my characters, living with them, you know, Shahi and Naz very much at the end when I was, you know, finishing the final colors on the final page, I was really sad to say goodbye to them. They felt like I was living with them. They were living with me this entire time. Um, and, and it really felt so, so different because it's also, you know, I think Pashmina was definitely that story of um, kind of looking in, right? And understanding yourself, understanding your family. Jukebox is still a story about family. Um, and, the, you know, the two cousins, Shahi and Naz, and, you know, trying to find um, Shahi's dad. But it's a mystery, you know, and it's time travel and it's an adventure. And it's just, I mean, at the very beginning, I remember saying, I don't know if I said it to you or if I said it to, to my agent, but I, I said, I just want to make a story about two brown girls who go on a time traveling adventure and go to places where there are just people of color, you know, like we're not just erased from history. Um, 
and I feel like, you know, at a very base level, that is what I achieved. And, and, um, you know, I feel really happy about that. So. Hmm. That's so exciting. And, and yeah, you're in for, you're in for a treat if you get to crack this one open and see, uh, yeah, the music, you're also visiting different eras and different, there's, a, there's your whole love letter to, to the musicians and all this. Mm -hmm. There's many layers to, to enjoy with this. So, okay, so, and Faith, so, I mean, we could, yeah, you, you said like, no, it's, it's more than 15 books, I think you've done. Uh, I've drawn 15. Uh, I've written more, because I oh, also- Right, right, and then you have a novel, and I mean, it's just like, yeah, you've been, you've been churning. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for so many, so many years. So you're, I mean, you're a pro. I think you're also, yeah, yeah. You're, you're an amazing talent. I mean, to begin with, like I remember some of your early, early books, you know. And I, I remember, I think the first one I ever read of yours was the at the time it was the War at Ellesmere, and I, I yeah, and I thought it was so great. And then, and then not long ago, we decided, okay, hey, let's do a reissue of yeah. that. And you did, and it's like you're not content to just like color it in and put it back out you're like no you redraw the whole thing <laughs> you know and then it's colored and it's like and we ended up calling it one year at Ellesmere yeah um, and it's still great it's better but it's like you're you're not afraid of hard work <laughs> <laughs> no no I mean I, I uh, well comics I mean this is a ridiculously challenging art form and I love it so yeah. much and, you know here I am uh, let's see, I've been working full-time in comics since 2008, so 12 years later, and I still feel challenged by this medium, which is, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful for First Second because they've allowed me to bring some of my backlist into, into the current market, which is, which is very, very different from when I first started drawing and publishing comics like 12 years ago. Um, back then the idea of like, I don't know, comics for, for girl readers specifically, uh, women and girls was like uh, shocking and unheard of. Um, so it was really interesting to be a part of that, that first wave of women cartoonists really pushing into the, the book publishing sphere in particular. Um, there were still lots of women cartoonists working, but not necessarily in the book publishing sphere. Um, so yeah, I have Nothing Can Possibly Go Wrong, which is a, uh, an older young adult graphic novel that I drew that came out, I think, in 2013. So now for a second has colored it. Initially, it was published in black and white. Um, so now for a second has colored it and is going to be publishing a brand new edition. Um, it's a really goofy, fun YA story. It's about these two guys, Nate and Charlie. Nate is a nerd. Charlie's a jock, but they've been friends for a really long time. Uh, but then they end up competing against each other in a high school election and things go horribly wrong from there. Uh, so it's like classic YA, lots of humor, lots of comedy, some feelings, maybe a little <laughs> romance here and there. Um, so yeah, oh, and it is based on a unpublished young adult novel by Prudence Shen. So it is me adapting her story. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that we'll find, you know, hopefully find new readers because uh, the, the book market or the YA comic book market is very, very different now than it was seven years ago. So really excited. For this. Two years ago. Yeah, no, it's totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's really different. Um, no, we're feeling it's, it's interesting because we're in this time now, you know, there's been multiple changes. Yeah, it's really comics and it's like suddenly we're like, hey, you know what that it had a little moment, but we feel like this deserves a big moment, you know, and here we go. We're going to give it another another life here. It's, it's, I um, mean, yeah, it feels really different now because, you know, like from my observation, it, it was like there was a bit of a boom in the, the aughts where comics were suddenly becoming popular. Yes. Um, but then it felt like it subsided and it kind of went away. And now like we're seeing massive growth from published graphic novels. Like we're seeing Raina Telgemeier become a superstar and outsell authors like Stephen King, which is crazy. Um, like I remember when Smile first came out in 2010, I remember tweeting, and I still have this tweet. So, you know, I have proof that I tweeted this, but I remember tweeting, um, this book is so good, Smile is so great. Um, and it, you know, if everything was fair in the world, it would sell a million copies. And that was completely unheard of for a graphic novel to sell a million copies. Like I was imagining this pie in the sky scenario and now it has sold tens of millions of copies. So go figure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be a part of it. Can I, can I mention go, uh, Ride On as well? Yeah, please tell us about Ride On. I was hoping you would, and we'll, we'll throw in some pictures as well. 
Yeah, so, you gotta tell us about Ride On. Ride On is the graphic novel I drew during this pandemic. I just finished it a couple couple weeks ago, though now it still has to be colored. Um, and it is inspired by, by my, my childhood experiences of being a horse girl. I was obsessed with horses and rode horses for many, many years. Uh, all the books that I read for horses, I only drew horses. I, know, I didn't draw a person until I was in like high school. I only drew horses. Um, so Ride On is based on that experience, experience of young women and one guy, one boy at this riding stable and their friendships, their relationships, the drama. It's also based on uh, the collapse of a childhood friendship I had where my very best friend, my very best friend in horses, her parents bought her a horse and I was not allowed to ride it. <laughs> so yeah, crazy consequences as a result of that drama. So yeah, I have a 200 plus page graphic novel coming out that is filled with horses. So that was, I don't know, it's horses are so hard to draw, but I'm so excited for this graphic novel. It will be out second beginning of 20 you do a phenomenal job your horses are really really super thank you thank you <laughs> i mean i think you should you should sell a million copies just because you drew a bunch of horses like <laughs> everybody knows that nobody wants to draw um a lot of horses so the fact that you not only like did it um but probably did it in a pure faith way like so well um yeah. i think that that should do really well <laughs> More power to you yeah, I mean, initially I was like, I don't want to draw this book. I want to write it. And I was kind of hoping to find an artist who liked drawing horses, but that did not materialize. And finally, I was like, you know what? You're like, like no, it's not, your destiny was not, uh, you're not going to let you off the hook here. <laughs> it's great. I mean, I feel, you know, genuinely these, these, these books that are, that are represented here, that you're the, you're the face of today in this little, little, little video. Uh, these are these are really exceptional, remarkable things. You know that I feel I'm so proud to champion this into the world. You know I feel like this these are going to be read. You know, twenty, thirty times <laughs> by these you know young readers, young and old, and uh, and some of them. You know, for them that's going to be the thing. You know, that's going to be the one that really gets them, the one that has that special place. And we're, you know, we're grown up. And for us, you know, it's harder to, we're harder to imprint, you know, we're harder to Im impress in the sense of like clay, you know, when you're young, it's like when something really speaks to you, God, it goes in deep, right? And you're, you're going to treasure it, you know, for your life. It's part of your psychic landscape in a way. And, 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 um, and I feel really good about the, you know, handing these books <laughs> to, to the next um, generations of young readers. I wish we had a, a whole lot more time and I, I do hope before too long, uh, we'll be able to do an ALA in person together, have our coffee at a table together and maybe with a room full of friendly librarians to, to discuss things with. and answer more questions, but I guess this is the next best thing. Um, so I want to thank you very, very much for being here, for your beautiful work. Uh, and, and I'm very, very proud uh, to be offering it into the world. And thank you also to, to Mary and to Kristen and to the amazing Macmillan School and Library team. Thank you so much, Mark. What a joy this has been. Mm. Thanks, everyone. This is great yeah, fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Faith. Bye, Kate.